Sir William Crookes was a British chemist and physicist who had a lot of different interests. He's probably best known for discovering the element thallium and for pioneering the use of vacuum tubes. In 1864, Crookes was trying to determine the atomic weight of thallium when he noticed something strange. While weighing samples of thallium in a vacuum, he noticed that they weighed less when they were hot than when they were cold. He thought he may have found a connection between heat and the force of gravity, so he started on a long series of experiments to carefully investigate the effect. First he determined that the effect didn't just occur with thallium, he tried lots of different materials and different ways of measuring the effect. The first experimental setup that gave him good reputable results was the device that you see here. It is essentially a microbalance inside a sealed glass tube. There are two balls balanced at the ends of a rod. The rod pivots on a needle sharpened on both ends that simply rests on the walls of the glass tube. When Crookes put a source of heat underneath one of the balls, it would make the ball rise. With the air inside the tube at atmospheric pressure, this was obviously being caused by convection currents. As he started pumping air out of the tube, the ball would respond less and less to the heat until at around 1,000 pascals, which is only about 1% of atmospheric pressure, no amount of heat could make the ball move. At this point, there was not enough air in the tube for the convection currents to make it move. But Crookes continued to pump out the air, and at around 400 pascal, the ball suddenly began moving up again. This was clearly no longer due to convection currents. Something else had to be happening, or so he thought. As he continued reducing the air pressure, the ball would respond more sensitively to heat. At very low pressure, just the heat from his finger touching the glass tube would make the ball shoot up. His conclusion was that infrared radiation was exerting pressure on the ball, making it move. It seemed to him that the only effect of the residual air inside the tube was to impede the movement of the ball. He thought that if he could remove all of the air from the tube, the effect of radiation pressure would be even more pronounced. This turned out not to be the case. It was the residual gas in the tube that was causing the balls to move up, but his equipment at the time was not good enough to detect this. He continued improving the apparatus as well as his vacuum pump. By 1876, he had come up with what looks very much like the radiometers that you see today. Instead of balls, there are four discs mounted on arms attached to a spindle. One side of each disc is black, while the other side is white. When exposed to light or infrared radiation from a heat source, the veins turn with the white sides leading. He calls this device a radiometer because, as he says, it serves to measure the amount of radiation falling upon it by the velocity with which it revolves. He did many experiments with this device and was firmly convinced that it was the force of light falling on the disks, called radiation pressure, that was causing the rotation. By this point, his work was starting to attract the attention of many of Britain's best scientists. The British physicist James Clerk Maxwell, from which we get Maxwell's equations of electromagnetism, had predicted the phenomenon of electromagnetic radiation pressure, and at first he thought that Crookes may have discovered an example of it. But he soon realized that what Crookes was seeing could not be due to radiation pressure. The most obvious reason is that the veins were turning the wrong way. Since light is reflected from the white side and absorbed by the black side, the white side should have twice as much force on it as the black side, so the veins should turn with the black side leading. The great fluid dynamicist Osborne Reynolds became interested in Crookes's work. He was convinced that it was the dynamics of the residual gas in the apparatus that was making the veins move. He proposed a new phenomenon by which gas moves from a cold area to a hot area along a surface. He called this phenomenon thermal transpiration and devised some experiments to demonstrate it. He was convinced that this is what was causing the veins to move. The physicist George Stokes, who was president of the Royal Society at the time, was very interested in Crookes's work and gave him suggestions for new experiments to try and new ways to modify the radiometer. Through these experiments, Crookes slowly came around to the idea that it was the residual gas that was causing the veins to move. What finally convinced him 
was that he found that the vanes would stop turning when the pressure got low enough. No gas, no turning. A colleague of Reynolds named Arthur Schuster did an experiment that definitively proved that it could not be radiation pressure making the vanes move. He suspended the radiometer as a bifiller pendulum and showed that shining light on it made the vanes and the bulb surrounding the vanes turn in opposite directions. This was proof that the forces causing the rotation were being generated inside the bulb. The Irish physicist George Johnstone Stoney came up with an explanation for how the gas does this. He proposed that since the black side was hotter, molecules would recoil from it with greater energy than from the white side, thus making the veins turn the way they do. It's a plausible explanation and the one that Crookes found most convincing, but it is not entirely correct. What you see here is a plot of the force on the radiometer veins versus the pressure in the bulb. The force and pressure have been divided by their peak values, so the peak force is a value of 1 at a pressure equal to 1. At a fixed temperature, the density of molecules inside the bulb is directly proportional to the pressure. Therefore, this plot also shows a relationship between the force and the density of the gas. At zero pressure, there is no force on the veins since there is no gas. As the pressure increases, it reaches a maximum and starts to go down as the pressure continues to increase. Stoney's explanation is correct at very low pressures, where the density of molecules is so low that they don't interact with one another. They simply bounce between the veins and the glass bulb. The ones coming off the black side have more energy, so there is more force on that side, but there are not enough molecules to generate enough force to make the veins move. As the density of molecules increases with increasing pressure, the imbalance of forces between the black and white sides of the vein eventually become large enough to make the vein move. But the increased density of molecules also means that they start bouncing off each other. The molecules leaving the black side will scatter away some of the approaching molecules, reducing the force on the black side. This is why the force peaks and then starts to decrease as the pressure continues to go up. This scattering away of approaching molecules occurs most effectively near the center of the vein. Near the edge, fewer of the molecules are scattered away, so this is where the force is concentrated as the density increases. So we can divide a vein into three regions as shown in the figure. In region 1, the forces on the two sides of the vein balance each other out. In region 2, the same number of molecules strike the white and black sides but the ones striking the black side come off with more energy, so there is more force on the black side in this region. There is a force on region 3 acting from the black toward the white side due to the phenomenon of thermal transpiration proposed by Osborne Reynolds. This is the tendency of a gas to move along a surface from cold to hot, exerting a force on the surface in the opposite direction. If you're interested in more details on how the radiometer works and in its history, see the book The Enigma of the Crookes Radiometer by Stefan and Richard Hollis.